Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to MIT's Faculty Forum Online. I am Chelsea Graham, a master's alum from 2014 and research associate at the Center for Transportation and Logistics. I will serve as a moderator today. This broadcast is sponsored in part by the MIT Federal Credit Union, MIT Professional Education, and MIT Sloan Executive Education. A reminder that after we hear from today's guest, we'll field your questions for, for him. Please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar to ask them. We'll get to as many as time allows. Today, we'll talk with Yossi Sheffi, a professor of engineering systems and director of MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. Professor Sheppy is the author of the new Abnormal, Reshaping Business and Supply Chain Strategy Beyond COVID-19, published this fall. We'll post a link to his full bio in the chat. Welcome, Professor Sheppy. Thank you very much, Jesse. And uh, let me start the presentation by sharing my screen. It will take a minute. So let me share and then let me start. Okay. So again, thank you very much, Jackie, uh, Chelsea. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Paige. And thanks everybody who is uh, online. So um, I'll be talking about uh, my book that I work on from March through August, came out on, or to September. It came out on October 1st. I did self-publishing because uh, Amazon takes about 1% of the time that it takes a uh, professional publisher to do it, or MIT Press or Harvard Business School. Of it. Anyway, the book is called the, the New Abnormal, Reshaping Business and Supply Chain Strategy Beyond COVID-19, as uh, Chelsea mentioned. So let's dive, let's dive right into the presentation. And I start with what I call the Anna Karenina principle. And the reason is that the supply chain are subject to many disruptions, of course, because they are global, take place all over the world, disrupted all the time. And uh, when you look at all the disruption, what comes to mind is uh, to the storyline in uh, Arna Karenina, when he says, said, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And the corollary here is that every disruption is different. It has its own causes, its own effect, its own cascade. No two are exactly the same. Yet. One of the interesting things is that the management of every risk and every disruption involves many of the same steps, uh, prevention, detection, response. And so there are generic preparation steps and generic management steps. So I will talk now about the steps that were taken during the, uh, during the pandemic by most leading companies. And they include several items. First of all, companies set an emergency management center. Now, many companies had center like this, but there were a room that looked a lot of screen, that looked at the weather, look, uh, give all kinds of information. Today, this, uh, or during the pandemic, these centers were, of course, virtual. But uh, the important thing is they were a center of communication and decision making, as we'll see in a minute. Importantly, good companies communicated obsessively and CEOs communicated even when they didn't have all the information, even when they didn't have all the answers. They understood that frequency is much better than uh, completeness. So it's okay to say, I don't know how to solve this. I don't know what will happen with this or that, but we're working on this. So try to build confidence that way. Now, and a phenomenon that happened in every, disru every large disruption is that people who care for the company jump to help. Everybody wants to help everybody, especially when it has to do with supply chain operation because the product is not moving. And this is usually a big problem because people usually high up get involved in decisions that are further down the organization that don't know all the detail. So the, the, the slogan that we develop is uh, swim your lane. I mean, just do your job, as uh, Bill Belichick used to say, not jump into anybody else's job. Companies review suppliers because many suppliers went down. Some of them had the uh, capacity problem. Many of them had quality problems. And this is something that should be um, 
attention should be paid to every time there's a disruption. We see quality issue, we see fakes. Right now, we have a problem with fake vaccines that are starting to get into the supply chain. Uh, people are paying, people in China are already paying king's ransom to get vaccinated, and they never know if what they get is the real vaccine or not. Uh, in many disruptions, the question is, you may not have all the parts to build all the products that you need to build, and you may not have uh, enough product to give all the customers. So how do you prioritize which customer get their orders and how much of the order they get? In the book, I give a whole framework on how to think about it and how to, uh, uh, to operationalize it. We're going into a recession when uh, cash is king and companies have to be aware that lengthening terms of pay to their suppliers may put their suppliers at risk because suppliers also have cash problems. What many companies did during the pandemic, and this happens in most recessions, is cut, num cut the number of what's, what's called stock keeping unit, SKUs. Uh, the example is, is the General Mill that cut the number of progressive soups a few months ago from 90 to 50 varieties. Why do they do it? First of all, they want to make sure that the fast seller, the good sellers are always on the shelf. So they cut down the number to simplify the logistics, but it also cuts costs because you don't have change over or less, you minimize the number of change over during the manufacturing process. So it, it helps cost. It, it happens in most recessions. Finally, companies make sure that the crisis does not go to waste and they plan for the recovery by taking some tough decision, decide, because there's nothing like a crisis to tell you who is a good customer and who is a good supplier and, and who can work under pressure in terms of employees and which division works, which doesn't work, which plant works, which plant doesn't work. So the idea is who is gonna be with us in the future, whether it's people, divisions, supply chain channels, distribution channels, what have you. Let's talk about the uh, recovery. I mean, uh, China is the only country that went to the, really to a V recovery, da severely down and immediately back up. Um, people are talking about U recovery, we are still hope for it, or L recovery when stuff does not come back or for a while, or W when we jump up and down. That's actually not the way to look at it. I define it as a whack-a-mole recovery. You know, the game of whack-a-mole when you have moles jumping from the ground and you have to hit them with a the mullet. We, we will see random flare up and shut down and reopening around the world in random times and random, and random regions. And supply chain have to handle the fact that sometimes that suppliers, these suppliers, this area of, of, uh, uh, of the country, of the world will have demand suddenly go to zero because people go home depending on the product or skyrocket. And unfortunately, we still see people are getting together and infecting each other. So this will just continue for a while. We see it in the US, we see it in Europe, see it in not too many other places, but it's basically the rich countries, so, uh, the US and uh, um, Europe. Uh, how do we fight it right now? You know, if you think about 9-11, uh, what we did, we created safe zones. So you got into an airport or a, you know, a sport arena or in some countries a shopping mall, you had to be searched just to make sure that, or everybody else will, be, will feel confident to get into the facilities, allow people to start flying again, of course. With, co with COVID-19, we're gonna have the same thing. We have to create minimal infection danger areas everywhere where people congregate. And we do it, we do it by testing, we do it by taking temperatures, we do it by quarantining uh, people. And as long as it's done on a massive scale, because it's done, when you're going to the airport, everybody has to do it. We're not there yet that everybody has to be tested all the time, aside from institutions like MIT that do it, but uh, many other places do not. And this, this in fact is, Today, it's a new competitive advantage. It's, a, it's an HR competitive advantage. How do you run your HR policy uh, and how do you manage to create a relatively safe zone is a competitive advantage. Now, when we think about who did COVID-19 hit and what happened, you know that we people who were old and weak and had the previous conditions were hit hard. 
Same thing happened with companies. Company will weak, uh, already not in good shape, already maybe over leveraged, or hit hard. Look at the uh, US department store revenues, not particular department store, all of them. All the revenue were over $30 billion in March 99 and kept going down, down, down. They got to about $11 billion just before the pandemic. And now they're actually below eight. This figure is from March. They're now well below eight. Many companies have exited the business. On the other hand, lots of companies have adjusted to the, uh, to the new abnormal, whether it's uh, automobile companies that started building ventilators, Flex, the uh, uh, contract manufacturers was building ventilators. Companies like New Balance, right here in Boston, started making masks. Interesting, took them four days to make to make the mask. This is yours truly, putting the mask on. It looks like it's made from a shoe. I mean, you see the laces behind. Actually, very cool. Um, ST in. A, the beginning of April already had 60,000 people selling masks on its uh, site. It encouraged people to do it. And companies like 3M quadruple their, uh, their production. Other companies adjusted in various ways. Burberry had uh, developed an app that you can talk directly to customer service representative who will show you how to use their, uh, their product. Savas is a company in the Nashville uh, company that uh, makes custom leather jackets. And these are actually on their site. These are actually videos that show how to take exact measurements so you can still get a custom leather jacket without coming to the store. And Sephora, which is known for lots of customer service representative in the store showing women and men how to put makeup on, uh, started doing everything online. IKEA developed a very nice, uh, app when you can look on you can choose item on the website and using augmented reality put it in your home so you can see what it will look like in your home there are many many other examples what we did see is the uh, e-commerce e took off completely uh i have this q2 revenue this is from uh, this is what i had when i uh, when i wrote the book but uh, you see walmart for example went the sales went up 9%, but e-commerce almost doubled. Target is doing very well, by the way. Tripled its e-commerce uh, sales. Uh, and and the, the, the native e-commerce company, Amazon, JD.com, Alibaba, went up uh, 30 to 40%, of course, from a very high base. Companies like Shopify. Shopify is a company that develops, that gets small and medium-sized retailers and other companies online very quickly. You have everything uh, that you need to create a catalog, to pay, to send. They now, in, in uh, June 2020, they had 1.3 million customers. These customers are all businesses. And even Facebook started going into the e-commerce business. One of the things, one of the striking uh, phenomena that you see that, that we saw during the uh, pandemic was not only the proliferation of lots of um, systems and technology, but how fast companies adopted them. In many companies, systems were adopted without a lot of legal oversight, without a lot of, um, a lot of uh, approval layers, system for connectivity, for visibility, uh, shipment visibility, for computation, big data, a lot of optimization system, and a lot of companies came onto the cloud because it made it easier, of course, to connect to other systems on the cloud. So some of the automation system that uh, we all hear about this, you know, whether it's a autonomous truck, there's a, lots of development in autonomous trucking, last mile delivery already working with delivering pizzas and other um, items, sidewalk robots, that, you know, send you a text when they get close to your house and you come in and you have a code and you open it and take your stuff. Uh, last mile drones are working not in urban area yet, but in many parts of the world, especially for medical supplies. Many warehouses are using drones to take inventory, basically flying through the, through the aisle and taking inventory. 
And then there's a robotic process automation, which is all the robotics that happened behind the, when you call UPS, for example, and you try to get something. It's not only the, the, the unbelievable deep menu, but you're actually talking to a robot. You're talking to a system. It's very hard to get a human being. Uh, insurance companies are actually get to the pro to the point that like nationwide is leading in this, get to the point that they can approve sending money to a person about 70 or 80 percent of the time without the human being getting on the phone. And a lot, you know, in, in transportation in particular, it's a very high touch uh, area where you have bill of lading and need multiple signature on it. A lot of companies develop a wireless, uh, wireless signature on bill of lading. Let me give you one example of a company that does actually very well in this, uh, in, in this variable demand uh, regime. So of course, what you need is flexibility because things changing all the time. On the other hand, you know, distribution network are for every company you have the network that's asset intensive because it's long-term investment and even long-term contract you cannot get, usually it's 10 years, 20 years contract. And it's uh, fixed, it's, uh, it's custom made and, and fixed. And uh, on the other hand, e-commerce is surging dynamically. And if you're in this business, you need to compete with Amazon. So how do you compete with Amazon? Amazon is very good. Uh, Amazon right now has 43% of the e-commerce business going to close to 50% in two or three years. They have the biggest selection, they have the lowest price, they have the fastest delivery, just as in many ways the best. How do you deal with it? And they, the reason that they have they have such a good service is they have all these fulfillment centers that are, they invested $40 billion in the last five years and they have distribution centers close to every population center. So this is the, the, the Amazon fulfillment center network, very close to most populations that they can serve 96% of the US uh, population basically the next day. So uh, how do you compete with this? Well, this company realized that the warehouses are not always full. Some have too much space. When you have a startup company that signed up for a long-term contract and can't fill them up or their seasonality or their business is up, business is down, so you have too much or not enough. Some other businesses need more space for a short time, like for a, for a promotion, also because of seasonality, also because of a, you know, a decline of the business. So what did this company do? They started, by the way, before the pandemic, but took off during the pandemic. So they have over a thousand warehouses. How do you get over a thousand warehouses? Well, you get it by not owning any warehouses. The same way that the, you know, uh, Lyft is getting tens of thousands of cars without own, owning one car. Or Uber is getting, you know, 10,000 trucks without owning one truck. They have, an, you know, a platform. They put, they got a contract with over a thousand warehouses all over the country and they put their software side by side with the operating system at the, uh, um, at the warehouse for a, a so-called warehouse management system. That's tied to logistics, tied to, tied to distribution. But in any case, what they created is basically the Airbnb of warehousing or the cloud computing of warehousing. So why does it work so well? Because they have massive reach. They have warehouse anywhere you need a warehouse, they have a warehouse. You have no startup cost. You pay by the glass rather than by the bottle when you, when you sign up with them. So depending how much, um, uh, how many SKUs you put there, how much material you put in the, uh, in the warehouse, that's you pay by the piece. There's no fixed cost commitment. You can start and finish whenever you need to. And you have the same technology platform in all your warehouses, regardless of where they are can open one anywhere, you can, uh, and you have, because it's one system, you have one view of the entire inventory, you can get, it takes them about a week to 10 days to get you up and running anywhere in the country that 
that you choose. And it, of course, it offer flexibility. It offer one more thing. Let's say you want to just test something. You say, what, what will happen if I will offer one day service in order to compete with Amazon? What happens if I'll offer four hour service or two hour service? What, what will happen? Uh, how do I know how much more would I sell? What will be the so-called lift of the, uh, of the product set? And so they can do an experiment. We'll put you in, choose your, choose the place around the country. You choose, I don't know, Cleveland. You put the, they put a warehouse in Cleveland and they put your product there and you start marketing it for a month, two months, three months, whatever. And you see, you see how much, what kind of lift you get when you, when you do a fast service at a certain price point, you can also change the price point. Anyway, so they, they also have some extra services. They have fulfillment services. They help you for, for fulfillment. They book transportation. They offer visibility to the customer and a lot of analytics. Okay, end of this example. Let's now come back to what happened during the pandemic and specifically talk about the media because a lot of things that we heard in the media and still hearing are just wrong. Heard about the failure of supply chain. Heard about the end of just in time. The end of reliance on China. And reshoring will happen in space. I would argue that none of this is gonna happen or very far from the extent that people think it would happen. Let's talk about failure of supply chain. I would argue on the contrary, it was their finest hour of, of, of supply chain. Think about, for example, the food supply chain. We saw a lot of headlines about food shortages, no egg, no meat, no granola bar, what have you. Uh, the food supply chain, overnight, all the institutions, suddenly no restaurant, no institutions, which is about half the business of, uh, of food goes to institutions to, uh, you know, whether it's the uh, restaurants at Google, whether it's the uh, um, cafeteria at MIT or restaurants, this is half the business. And they, by the way, don't buy in consumer friendly packages. They don't buy in small, you know, half a pound packages with all the uh, uh, information on it about calories and, uh, and sugar and fat, whatever. They buy in bulk. And the machinery that comes from the food factory is all automated and put it in bulk and very few um, household and supermarket can, can buy in a hundred pound sacks. Not only this, the items consumed have changed. Even the item bought in the supermarket changed. A lot less fresh food, more canned food, more, you know, uh, bread, pasta, comfort food, basically. On top of it, we had some plant closure. Well, not for a long time, but for a week or two weeks at a time. And still, it was rare that you couldn't get really full. You could get, maybe you can get sometimes the cut of meat that you like, but you could buy some other cut of meat or you buy other protein. You, could get, you couldn't get the, live, the flavor of, uh, um, of granola bar that you like, but you had others. Couldn't even get the... Uh, fluffy, nice Procter & Gamble toilet paper. But if you really wanted, you could get what the airlines are, are using, which is this, you know, thin stuff that you see in the airline bathroom or in institutions. Uh, after some time, because this took a significant adjustment. The problem is that the media show picture like this. Every night you saw on, the, on CNN and in the newspaper picture like this. I actually talked to some of the journalists and I said, I know when you took this picture. You always took them at night when the store closed. Because if you come in the morning, it will look like this. And it's not going to be as nice. And not too many people are going to click on it because people like to be frightened. So because they fundamentally did not understand the cadence of fulfilling and, and replenishing supermarkets. It happens overnight because you don't want the people who break out the pallets and, uh, and replenish the shelf to mix with the customers. So, and, and you even want less during, during the pandemic. So, but we saw very few pictures like this during the, uh, during the pandemic. So I would say buy a nice supply chain with number one, with one exception. 
PPEs and medical supplies, some medical supplies, especially PPEs, uh, uh, personal protective equipment. This, however, I don't fault companies for this. This is a government fault because the US, the US used to have a significant strategic reserve of, uh, of medical supplies. It was started during the Clinton administration, built significantly high during the Bush administration, then withers to nothing during the Obama administration and the Trump administration did nothing, uh, nothing to it. But when the, when the pandemic came, they, uh, they found out they got nothing. We are very, very little. Uh, this is something we can talk more about how to solve it. In my book, I describe how to solve this problem. But uh, let's take the next subject, which was the end of just in time. How can it be the end of just in time? The Toyota production system, which is just in time, is part of is the most important manufacturing supply chain innovation maybe ever. Ever is an exaggeration. I would say the industrial revolution was just was even more important, but very important. It does call for minimizing inventory, but it also results in more resilience and flexibility because it calls for connecting suppliers and the companies and customers very tightly so they have good communication and respond very quickly to changes in demand, for example, or to problems in manufacturing. It did introduce high quality through low inventory because you didn't have to work through a whole inventory pile when you had something flawed. And because nobody on the line, when, when they saw a, a defective part, could just go to the pile of inventory, take another one, they had to find out immediately what's wrong. It brought high quality. It, it resulted in low waste, a lot of worker participation. The result was very low cost, high quality product. And we all, well, not all of us, but some of us my age remember the time when the Toyota cars were so good after they implemented the production system, the, the United States had to instill voluntary quota on Japanese cars, just to make sure that the uh, domestic auto industry will not be decimated. Finally, out of China. And again, I'm not sure. And I say I'm not sure this is based on data and discussion with uh, lots of companies who are working in China. Um, first of all, many companies are not in China due to low cost anymore. Uh, this is the uh, cost in China are going up. And those companies are in China because of low costs like uh, garment manufacturing already move, have been moving the last day, decade to other Asian countries, uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, especially and almost uniquely the last stage of the manufacturing, the cutting, of, uh, the cutting and sewing of the, uh, of the cloth. Because the making the textile, which is very uh, sophisticated, involves significant, uh, uh, significant uh, capacity investment, significant money, as well as high tech, uh, automotive, aviation, Sophisticated product industries are not going to leave China. They spent decades building a whole ecosystem of supplier and their supplier and their supplier of that supplier in China. Those guys are just too good. Uh, they are innovative, they have speed, capacity, responsiveness. You cannot just find it anywhere. Some companies balance the uh, procurement in China by having supply in China, manufacturing in China, with what's called China plus one strategy. So they put some extra, they don't get out of China, but the next uh, incremental investment, especially if it's the last stage of manufacturing in the assembly, is going, uh, they put somewhere, it's not necessarily Western supplier, even though there's a lot of uh, political pressure to reshore, a lot of it is going actually to Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, some to Mexico, some to, uh, to Eastern Europe. Uh, mostly, well, going there is the final assembly because this is the stuff that the uh, political class sees and, and the media. They don't realize that the whole set of suppliers and their suppliers, their suppliers, what's called the whole bill of material made uh, somewhere else. Uh, of course, some companies who are in the United States are saying, we don't want to rely on the United States and actually start operation elsewhere. Finally, what's most important is China is still a very large and growing market. Right now, it's the only healthy market around the world and uh, growing while other markets are shrinking. 
Finally, let me uh, mention some issues of concern when we talk about what happened during, uh, during the pandemic and specifically what happens looking into the future. First of all, sustainability. There's a lot of talk about the Green New Deal, building better. I think it's a good intention, but not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen because many people lost their job. Many people are actually underemployed, even if not uh, unemployed. For all of them, sustainability is a luxury good. Even before the pandemic, I argue and show with data in my, late, in my last book, before, before the one that I'm talking about now, which is called Balancing Green, talk about the, the huge gap between what, what people say and what people do. What they say is, of course, they'll pay 60, 70, 80% of people pay, say they'll pay more for sustainability. In practice, five to 7% do it. When you actually look at the supermarket shelf experiment that we did at MIT, we sent students to work at, to uh, look at the aisle and document what people are doing when, when products are side by side. So if consumers are not willing to do it in at scale, companies cannot invest if consumers are not gonna pay for it. Governments in trouble in general, they don't have money after all the trillions invested in fighting the pandemic. So it's not clear how this will happen. And, you know, even in Europe, the, uh, the, the Macron government or about two or three years ago tried to put carbon tax and uh, which would raise the price of diesel in, in France, I think by about two or 3%. And Paris started burning. There were demonstrations and valid demonstrations all over, all over France. So the Australian government failed when, when they had the, you know, when the opposition ran on X the tax uh, slogan. Anyway, uh, another worry is we talk about the end of globalization. There's a lot of, you know, call for ending globalization. And I fear that there'll be new globalization because the, the globalization 1.0 was labor, uh, labor arbitrage, basically people doing relatively low level work. Now we realize that if, I, if my office is in Boston and I can work from Kansas City or Miami, I can also work from Buenos Aires or New Delhi. So we talk about people who are making a lot of money, who are white collar workers, who can work wherever they want now. It was a proof that we can do it with, the, with what happened during the pandemic. And those people take the tax base with them. So a lot of bad things can happen, like a country can start competing on lowering taxes and, and, and damaging the tax base. It's, a, it's something that uh, may happen. Inequality expo was exposed in spades, not only in broadband access and uh, which lead to uh, problem in education, but fundamental difference between white collar workers who did okay during the pandemic, could work from home and blue collar worker, the people who work in uh, factories and distribution center and drive the truck and serve, serve everybody in the supermarket, those people are losing ground. Uh, many of them are out of work, people who work in restaurants, people who work in other hospitality industry, but uh, even, even others are not doing great. In addition, there's, a, there's bifurcation and increasing inequality between countries. We see countries in uh, the US, Europe, Japan, China have the money to invest in getting out of this. You require, by some estimate, a few more trillion dollars to, to, to rebuild the economy. People are talking about $10 trillion to rebuild the economy. Uh, African countries don't have it. Countries in Latin America and some in Southeast Asia just don't have it. So the, the, the gap will grow. Politics we see uh, as, in, uh, as in many other periods like this, the rise of populism and nationalism, and you can choose whatever you want. I mean, you see it all over the world. Uh, final, not finally, but the next point is the, the industrial concentration, the bigger getting bigger. We see it mainly in the tech industry, uh, not only in the tech industry, but mainly it's, it's, you know, it's now the, the media and Congress are dealing with it. The problem is that uh, 
the, the, the big companies, the, the, the Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Google are so big and so rich and so profitable, they simply buy all the competition, which means that they, and they offer you know, entrepreneurs a deal that entrepreneurs can hardly afford not to take, which means that we'll have less competition and less innovation as we go forward. The media is another point of uh, concern, whether it's uh, fake news or the fact that we all have segments of the population that each listens to its own echo chamber, not listening to each other. You know, President-elect Biden is talking about the, you know, unifying the nation. God, this seems like big, not so much because people think that the other side, in, in, in this election, Every side thought that if the other side is going to win, it's going to be the end of the world. It's going to be a disaster. It's going to be a calamity. Not just we lost the election, but it's calamity, you know. So, and now they each listen to their own, um, their own media. So they just encourage us the same thinking. Finally, the next pandemic. This pandemic, as bad as it was, as bad as it is, it's actually not that deadly. I mean, the number of deaths is relatively low, the percentage compared to Ebola. Ebola, you get Ebola, you have 50, between 50 and 55% you die. And even if you come out of this alive, you'll never be the same. Uh, SARS was about 30% mortality. Here we have very low mortality rate. And so we can think about the different pandemics and new, pandem new pandemics, new viruses, they're really even deadlier. So I hope when we come out of this one, we're not gonna think that, oh, okay, we found, we found vaccine, you know, we're okay now. We have to start preparing for the new one. Finally, just to give you a picture, if you want to read more, you have uh, uh, my six books. The first three are not dealing with uh, uh, risk and resilience, but the, the, the three on the bottom, the resilient enterprise, the power of resilience and the new abnormal, are all dealing with risk and resilience with some emphasis on supply chain, but it's a general business book. If you want even more information, you can go on my website, sheffy.mit.edu, and you get lots and lots more information and papers and blogs and to your heart content. So let me stop here and turn it back to Chelsea. Let me stop the, stop the sharing. And Thank you, Yossi. Uh, we had some great questions uh, come in during your presentation. I do just want to remind the alumni viewers to ask questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom, and you can also upvote the questions that you want to hear discussed. So um, the first question we have is from Larry Eisenberg. Wouldn't it make sense to reconsider our acceptance of offshore supply chains? Local supply would seem to assure a more reliable supply chain. The answer is as good as it sounds, I completely disagree. Because what will happen if we have, think about the US, we use only local manufacturer, local suppliers. Over time, first of all, you will not have the scale. Because if you think China will keep buying from us or the EU will keep buying from us when we will just uh, um, not, not use them, is, is a pipe. So we will have a relatively small market. We'll have a problem of scale. We'll have, a, what's even most important, there'll be less competition because local companies will know that, uh, you know, there's Buy America. By the way, there's slogan like this all over the world, Buy Britain, Buy China, Buy America. Uh, so if this, if this will happen, it's, it's very similar to actually put, effectively putting huge trade barriers around every country. So what you get is a, small market, which doesn't allow for scale. You get a lot less innovation because there's no need to. You have less competition. So products are not becoming better and it will lead to lower standard of living. In the book, by the way, I describe how you can keep globalization, how you can keep even just in time with emergency inventory. So maybe just I mentioned one point about it. One of the problem with the, with the, uh, with having too much inventory is not only that it costs money. Okay, we can pay for it. 
it, the, the problem is it leads to, as I say, low quality because you have to work through the whole inventory and don't discover a part that is in, until you realize a part is bad and, and you can get to the part too often. So what you have to do is the following. And I just describe one aspect very quickly. You run just in time, global, international, just in time, but you have what's called emergency inventory. So how to make sure that this emergency inventory cannot be used, cannot um, lead to lower quality, you can't use it. So think about how we use the strategic petroleum reserve. They were there in the ground and companies like uh, Exxon and Mobile and, and, and B, uh, BP put them in the ground, but they couldn't use them for day-to-day -day fluctuations when the price to, to, uh, uh, to deal with prices. Only the president can release them. So if you have something that, uh, that you need a special authority to release, then it doesn't lead to low quality. So you have things like this that can be done in order to have your cake and eat it too. But I believe that um, trying to close the, to put a moat around the United States and uh, build a wall, well, we try this, it doesn't work that well. I think you also in your book touched on, um, you know, building trust with your supplier and understanding your tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers as well. Um, so there's a there's a lot of good nuggets in there uh, regarding that. But, um, Thanks for the plug. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, next question is from Boris Zaretsky. The supply chain in the U.S. worked well. What about other countries, particularly the poorer ones? Yes. The, it's absolutely a, a good question. When, when I say the supply chain work well, I say the food supply chain work well, they work well in, um, they work okay, not, not, uh, not ideally, but work well given the pandemic in the US and in the EU. Uh, turns out that the pandemic, in, with some exception, but in Africa, for example, the pandemic is not that bad. The pandemic, the, 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 the uh, rate of infection is lower, much lower than in EU and the, uh, in the United States. They had a little more time. They saw what's happening in Europe, what's happening in the United States and prepared. They have really not great uh, public health system, but they did get the population to change behavior. They did get the population to wear masks, to social distance and people listen. So it was not in, in that sense that bad. Um, some countries that they both had lousy uh, public health system and did not prepare, like some countries in Latin America had disasters, real disasters. So um, Ecuador and other countries like this, a very high mortality rate and the economy was ruined and suffered the worst of it, the worst of all wars. So, it was not as bad as one can imagine. I mean, there were, a, there were significant economic damage, of course, in Africa and Latin America, but in many of these countries, the number of uh, the healthcare outcome were not surprisingly not that bad. Great. Um, okay, next question. Uh, I think I was anticipating this one too, or at least wanted to um, touch on this. Uh, Jay Kip asked, what do you think will be the net carbon footprint of COVID in America, better or worse than 2019? Okay, uh, one can first of all look to the, to the past. In 2009, following the, uh, the uh, back end of the financial crisis, uh, the emission went down about 1%, one, one and a half percent. In 2010, they shot up 5.2%. So it's a, that's the challenge. That's really the challenge because by now, if people don't believe in global warming, uh, then they just don't see what's in front of them. Uh, let me, I, I, as I know, by and large, I should say that I'm very skeptic and I'm very worried about this, but let me give you the, the upside. So it's <laughs> a, you know, the optimistic side. In my book, I have one section about the pessimistic side and followed by an optimistic side. The optimistic side is that even though 
We don't see, by the way, we should say, of course, that the pandemic and global warming are very similar in many aspects and they require the global problem, they require global cooperation. And it means very little if California on its own does some, uh, you know, doesn't allow plastic straws. Now it's, 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 it's even idiotic, it, it's nothing. It, it gives people the impression that something is done and, and it's a problem because it's not. Let me just adjust the light here. Um, so um, I lost my train of thought. What are we talking about? <laughs> um, I believe you were talking about it. A lot of people think it's a problem, but it's not. Yeah, no, no. Oh, it is. A, I, no, no, I believe that it is a huge problem, uh, you know, uh, global warming. And the way countries behave in terms of saying vaccine go first to me rather than to others is not going to generate a lot of goodwill for cooperation with global warming is the next huge problem or ex already existing problem facing. But let me give you the optimistic side. The optimistic side is that I believe the solution is new technologies. We do require some new technologies better than just renewable. And I talk a lot about it uh, uh, in my book. And we saw during the pandemic, a lot of cooperation between scientists. The, uh, the genome was replicated over a thousand times, you know, around the world very quickly. Second, we saw that when the uh, rubber hit the road, so when we saw the result of the, the pandemic is real and it's dangerous, there was hardly a limit to the amount of money that was put into fighting both the economic side and encouraging technology to develop vaccines and therapeutics. So when, when the danger is clear, there's a lot of money to invest, which I believe if, if we will put developing new technologies, for example, air capture of carbon from the air, uh, carbon capture from the air, reducing the, the, the CO2 in the air already, not just reducing the, uh, the rate of growth. We saw what can be done with a few billion dollars of letting technology do it. And we also st start seeing, and I hope people will start see seeing this. How can somebody ignore the fact that this year was the worst year in terms of hurricane, the largest number of hurricane ever, not in the last five years, not in the last 10 years, ever since we have the fires in Colorado, the fires in California, all the floods all over the world. How can one ignore this? So I hope we're getting close to starting to realize the magnitude of the problem, realizing that money is there to, uh, uh, to put into it, and uh, people will be willing to forego some um, say conveniences in order to do it. Right now, people are not willing to do it. But as we gather more and more evidence, and it's incumbent upon leadership, political leadership, to get to get the country ready for this type of investment. Thank you. Um, this next question from Lalit Panda, uh, it's very, very good one. Uh, between automation and labor globalization, what can be done to improve prospects for the American worker? Hi Lalit, Lalit was a student of mine 100 years ago, but uh, <laughs> he looks better than me, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> um, what can be done? There, there was a, there's just a report released two days ago by MIT about the future of work that talks exactly about this issue. And unfortunately, the, uh, it documents very well, very well the problem. The solution are the standard solution. You know, re-education, investment in education, investment in training, uh, because the march of technology is, is basically unstoppable. And so how do we deal with it? It's really interesting. I would look at how China is dealing with it. Because in China, China, by the way, one third of the robots in the world are now deployed in China. China is uh, moving into automation very fast and they have a huge population. And for the Chinese, for the Chinese elite, it's a question of survival. They kind of promise the, uh, the, the citizenry better, uh, better life every year. 
and growing GDP and jobs and all this, well, how are they going to deal with it when they are automating like there's no tomorrow? I visited a distribution center of JD.com. It's the competitor for, for Alibaba, smaller competitor, but enormous. JD.com had a, distrib a distribution center that they, that they rebuilt it. The old distribution center had uh, 400 workers per shift. The new distribution center had four workers per shift, literally four instead of 400, totally automated. Okay, uh, these people, the Chinese don't have a retraining uh, uh, regime and these people just lost their job. Um, so I would, I would look at China because I think they'll, uh, while the problem are not gonna be in the Chinese media because Chinese media is of course controlled, but uh, trying to find what they're doing. In, meanwhile, in democracies in the United States, in Europe, where this is of course happening, <coughs> excuse me, this is happening. The main solution was retraining uh, one of the candidates in the, in the Democratic Party suggested giving you know thousand dollars to every uh, every individual. Maybe we will get to solutions like this, where there's a certain amount of guaranteed money for every citizen. You just have to think about where the money is coming from. Uh, strong unemployment, uh, strong unemployment insurance, but basically trying very quickly to get people off unemployment into training for jobs of the 21st century. And it's not, uh, nobody, unfortunately, even this very good study and others like it are talking in generalities because it is not clear how do you bring somebody from high school to be able to do high level coding. But let me just say that there are, it may require, and I, I I didn't see it in the report, but in so in other reports, it may require a complete overhaul of the higher education system in the United States, because side by side with MIT, we should have community college that take people and train them to do something, even foregoing, um, you know, liberal uh, social science and uh, uh, liberal arts, but being in very quickly to the point they can do something and they can make a living. But it's a, it's a tough issue. Agreed. Um, I think we'll all uh, just see a lot of adaptation as we continue. Um, I have a very uh, specific question coming from Josh Davis, a former student of yours from 1980. Hi, Josh. And he is, uh, Josh is a COO of a very large school district in Virginia. Mixed experiences with PPE vendors has led to redundant ordering some low quality products and perhaps some waste. CARES Act funding has helped, but it expires at the end of the year. Can you suggest strategies for sourcing as they head into 2021? Okay, first of all, when we talk about the uh, sourcing, the fact that uh, we saw low quality and even fakes in many cases, it is something that happens when every time there's a shortage. Every people are coming out of the woodwork with low quality stuff, and when companies are desperate to get product and to get parts, you know, are falling for them. That's really, uh, really unfortunate. Uh, as I mentioned before, we, are, we already start seeing this with vaccines. I mean, we'll have a case whenever demand exceeds supply, we have people coming up with fake products. We saw it in PPE, the, the, the Dutch government had to throw out 600,000 masks that were totally substandard. They, uh, they were sold as N95, they were not, they were N5, like, you know, not really N95, not really uh, stopping 95 of the, of the aerosols. So, this is not, the question of, of government help is, is crucial here because it will allow people to keep quality, to keep the, uh, you know, experienced workers on the job and allow suppliers to, to keep working. I, I hope, well, as you say, some of the money ex expired at the end of December. This is a political question. I try in these talks when I do dozens of them in <laughs> my book, really, I did this is my 
45th or 46th talk on, on, on the book, try not to get dragged into uh, political arguments. But uh, one, I can, I just say that I cannot believe that because of the difference between what the Trump administration agreed to 1.8 trillion and the Democrat Nancy Pelosi wanted 2.4 million, they couldn't just agree on something. I mean, Jesus, the, the 1.8 trillion is a lot of money. Just get it out and keep arguing about other stuff. Meanwhile, people are suffering. It's heartbreaking to see the political gridlock when real people have problems. Real people are suffering. And it looks like Congress is living in another world, totally devoid from, uh, from the needs of, of the constituent, of the people who are from the bosses in some sense. It's just, it's just saddening and, and you know, dispiriting really to see this. And I, and I don't know how, how to solve it. I hope that uh, you know, it will solve relatively quickly that once the Trump administration will realize that it's over, They'll do some deal even before uh, this one expires. But and then it, of course, depends on the, on the election in Georgia, how the Senate will come. Right now, it looks like the Senate will be Republican. But there are about four Republican senators who are kind of on the moderate side. So uh, after January 20th, I hope that uh, some kind of relief can, can get back into, into the economy. Uh, as I said, I, I know all the reasons why one should not do a big one, why should make a small one, why I see around me, by the way, people who are really don't deserve it and take it and the small businesses who are doing fine, who take, you know, $200,000, yet they're doing just fine. It happens every time. I mean, but you cannot let the majority suffer because a few jerks around. So I hope we're not gonna focus on the jerks and uh, get the money out to a lot of people who just need it. I have no other solution for this. Yeah, it's, it's a tough problem. We're actually within the uh, center, we have a project um, with the Massachusetts State Department of Public Health trying to help them with their uh, PPE stockpile as well. Um, I think it's a, it's a problem everyone is trying to figure out currently. Um, and, and they have funding issues too. We won't get into that now. Um, yeah. <laughs> Looks like we have uh, time for about one or two more questions. Um, how do you prepare for the next pandemic? <laughs> how do you prepare for the next <laughs> pandemic? Okay. This touches the one area of failure. By the way, failure not only in the United States, failure in Europe as well. The preparation. To prepare for medical calamity, we need three things. We need to rebuild the strategic inventory of PPEs, not only PPEs, by the way. We need also strategic inventory of, further, of certain material to go into the final uh, manufacturing of certain, uh, certain therapeutic. It's not happened, but many of them are coming from India and China. They kept coming, it was not a problem. And a US company kept, uh, kept on the medical supplies. But it may happen in the future to think about it. But first and foremost, let's make sure that we don't get caught again with uh, not enough PPEs, not enough uh, gowns and gloves and, and other finished product that we can, uh, that we can keep. How to, mention, how to uh, uh, organize this? It's actually a discovery in well, very easy, no, very easy, it's relatively easy because the US has about five large distributor of, of, of medical supplies to all hospitals, they have 95% of, the, uh, of the market share. So you can make them keep the inventory so it will run and to not get stale. You pay for the inventory carrying costs and you don't let them go below a certain amount, just like I mentioned before, they need the presidential approval to go below a certain amount. That's one thing. So the, uh, uh, the example here are the petroleum reserves. Another example, you have to make sure that every hospital is, has enough inventory to withstand some amount, a month, two months of a pandemic. So you, you do it through auditing and you do it the same, through stress test. The same way that we did stress tests for banks 
after the 2008-2009. Banks had to go to stress test. Hospitals will also have to go to stress test. Different stress tests, but very similar. Can bank you know, have enough reserve in order to withstand people, people wanting their money or, or, uh, or other problems? Same thing with hospitals. The third leg of the stool is people. We now have cases in, around the country when there's simply not enough medical professionals to help people who are sick. So again, a parallel is the Army National Reserve. We need a medical national reserve. We need volunteers who will work in hospitals, let's say one weekend a month, and once a year we'll come for two or three weeks for training. And when something like this happens, they'll be called upon to help. So you need the, this is the three legs of a building of preparing for the next pandemic or the next other real tough medical problems. Great answers. Um, and we have uh, many more questions that we're not going to get to. Um, I will end with one last question from Albert Chang. Where did you get the awesome graphics for your presentation? I was actually wondering myself. Where did I get the graphics? Okay, so um, this is my sixth book. So it's not my first rodeo, but the, the last few books, what happens is there are a lot of very, very talented unemployed, you know, graphic designer in Massachusetts. Let me give you one statistic. So I, I'm working with a guy that I worked before, but the first time I worked with him is uh, I put an ad in Craigslist and say, I need a graphic designer for, or a, a, somebody who can do illustration for a set of presentation, because this also, I do it in my coursework, I use them in lots of other stuff. So I need somebody to help me with the, uh, the graphic because I, I can't draw. The amazing thing is I put, before I came to MIT, I left, I put the, the ad at 7.30. At eight, I came to the office, I had 58 responses in half an hour. So uh, then I went through a process of kind of trying to look at them, uh, narrow it to 10 and ask them to submit portfolios and look online at what they do. And I like this guy. He's a, <laughs> Gabe Polonsky is, is, is teaching in BU and he's very talented and uh, we work together. So uh, the only problem is busy. So I get, I have lots of requests and I get three or four a, a week from him, but uh, I get them, I incorporate them, I get them, I incorporate them into, into the presentation. So <laughs> that's the answer to this one. Great. Well, thank you so much. And on behalf of the Alumni Association, thank you for tuning into this MIT Faculty Forum online broadcast. And thanks again to Professor Sheffy for joining us today. We'll be sure to forward all questions asked via the Q&A to our speaker and to our staff, we'll keep the chat window open for networking purposes for another 15 minutes. This broadcast will be available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel within a week of today's airing. So thank you again to everyone for participating today. Thank you very much, Chelsea, and thank you everybody for listening. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.